Hello, chat. Rainy day out, huh? I'm glad I caught you before you caught a cold. Why don't we sit down and talk about what we're going to be doing today? It's going to be a little bit different. Uh, thank you for the subs and the gifted subs. Uh, give me just one moment. Let me readjust my size here. <laughs> Is this a role play? Nah. No, it's 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 gonna be a little bit different though. Am I gonna read you Shakespeare? It's gonna be pretty damn close. Give me a moment. I gotta drink something. <laughs> Would you like some tea? Hmm. So I've been entertaining this idea for just a little bit. I was thinking about doing it uh, once or twice, like a week. Just like a very, very low key, like atmospheric reading uh, of some sorts. And I found some games, like uh, today I'm gonna be playing a game called The Life and Suffering of Sir Bryant Brant. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the bits, Super Grump, and, and the subs. Thank you, guys. I, I I wish I could mute those, but I tried on Streamlabs and it didn't fucking work. Excuse me. Your your mother can't swear for these streams. Uh, but good night to everybody going to sleep, and good night to everyone that is going to be falling asleep during this stream, because that's kind of the goal. Can I turn up the rain a little bit? Of course, thank you. This is a little bit of a test run because I haven't worked uh, with this overlay yet. <laughs> it's your first stream? Oh, it's a weird one to be your first stream, but welcome. It's gonna be, it's gonna be very low key. See, I've been thinking lately and I've needed like some structure or like some themed streams or, or something to keep me like, you know. Keep, keep me a little bit structured. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> got shocks, thank you for the 20 gifted subs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. But I'm, I'm gonna do my best. Fire's a little loud now? Okay. I'm, I'm gonna do my best to keep it a little bit quiet, you know? Uh, I, I'm not gonna... I, like, I hate to ignore the subs, but I also don't want it to, like, derail the work, you know? Chill. <laughs> Thank you for the sub, Martinez. I'm not- there's gonna be no- no- no chillin'. No chillin' today. I sat down yesterday and I got this entire pose rigged up in, like, less than five hours. I just kind of went harm- ha I kind of went hard. Because the last Monster Hunter stream was a complete fucking disaster, and your mother needed to make up for it. <laughs> I went- I went haram. <laughs> uh, so... Either way, chat. Actually, do you guys want to see something really funny? So this is a little bit imperfect, because this model has a lot of parts. Um, but if I toggle my wine glass... Ta-da! <laughs> I have an invisible hand. Wait, I have a... <laughs> I have a floating hand. Maybe it's my, my servant. <laughs> it's holding it for me. Well, I mean, if... Thank you. Now go file this paperwork for me. <laughs> Anyways, today we're going to be playing... Uh, the Life and Suffering of Sir Bronte. And, and these are, again, these are going to be very chill, relaxed streams. Uh, streams for relaxation was the goal. I even mixed up some ambience for us. Uh, this game does have a little bit of a darker edge, uh, which I'm into. So I, I, I'm ASMR stream. See, that's my thing. I didn't want to do, like, pure, straight-up, raw ASMR. But like, it, just because I, I would have just been embarrassed about it. But this is pretty close. And I get to read stuff. Um, but hold on, hold on, let me, let me, mm. Okay, chat. Okay, chat. 
What was I saying before I got derailed? I'm... I've seen somebody play, like, chapter one of Sir Bronte a little bit. So you and I are both going into this uh, fresh and raw. <laughs> We're going into it blind. And thank you, Chlamydia. Oh, is it actually Chlamydia? <sighs> thank you for the 10 <laughs> gifted subs. Uh, really, really, really appreciate it. Yes, the baby mode is a separate model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. So, give me just a moment to set up my overlays. Uh, let's see. And let me... Oh, game cap. We're going to be mildly scuffed. My theater kit is showing. Oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> uh, let me bring... We were missing this little guy, so let's just slap him right over here. Actually, I think I should make my game cap a little bit bigger, don't you think? All right, there we go. It's story time, chat. It's story time, so so sit down, sit back, relax. Uh, and we are starting a new game. Actually, chat, you can help me with this. We need to name our Sir Bronte. We need to name our sweet, sweet boy. David, Bob, Choo Choo. Y'all aren't very good at this. <laughs> I like Reginald. Eric, Chad Cervante. I actually kind of like Chad. Kunk. <laughs> I kind of like Chad Cervante chat. Sebastian. A there's a lot of people in chat saying Chad. Well, the thing about this game is that we can do multiple playthroughs because there are many, many different uh, routes we can take with it. So if this route goes bad... Anyways. You hold the fate of a single man in your hands. You will follow his life birth to death. Your choices shall define who Sir Bronte will grow up to be. You will decide his personality, social status, and what mark he'll leave on history. With every step he takes at your behest, Sir Bronte's character will change and evolve. Your decisions will close some doors for him, but open many others. Why am I crying? Oh, fuck. No reason. <laughs> The world of Sir Bronte's birth is a ruthless realm. Where people are divided into estates. It is hard to be a hero here. Be ready to accept that Sir Bronte cannot overcome every challenge in his path. Path. Fuck. God. Every hard choice will test, test his character and personal qualities. Often you will not be able to make the choice you would like to. It may happen because you choose a different road earlier. Exhausted, your hero's willpower or haven't earned the right position in society. It's basically a telltale game. Mm. We'll see, we'll see. Every victory will be a struggle, a path carved with bitter losses and gut-wrenching failures, except the tragedy. This is how you will create a gripping and unique tale for your hero. What will become of your Sir Chad Bronte? his loved ones, and his world. It all depends on you. The story of my life remains written on these pages. But my fate has always been my own. Every deed, every choice, every person I met made me what I am. Thank you for the subgrading biscuits. I have taken biscuits. a different path? Could I have found a different calling? Altered the very course of history? And what price Altered would I have to pay? Of history. <laughs> I can't get my voice down that low. Oh, oh, alter the very course of history. At the end of time, your fingers are stained with ink, your breathing grows ragged, your hands are shaking, yet the words begin appearing on the page before you one by one, clinging together to form a chronicle of your own life. Who are you, and how did you reach this end? Hey, can you guys see my cursor? Actually, oh my god, my screen is so dusty. 
You were born, raised, and lived your entire life in the blessed arcane and Arc <laughs> Arcanian Empire. In this land, a man's destiny is predetermined at the moment of his birth. Whether human or Arcanian, nobleman, priest, or lowborn commoner, all bend to the divine will of the twin gods. And each life is not but a single cog in the universe's immeasurable machine. The memories come flooding back. They engulf you in a merciless wave, binding together days that are thrice dead and gone. The dreams of your childhood, your adolescence, your youth spent in the capital, years of peace teeming with life and a war drenched in blood. High ranks and lowly deeds, opulent palaces, secretive city, back streets, fields of battle, and faces, so many faces of the people you hold dear, the people who walk this road by your side. The reason I was asking about the cursor is that I'm like, I'm being a little frantic with it. And it's probably really distracting. Thank you for the sub, Omnic. Such was your life, now all exposed by ink, erupting onto the page. With your every step, you sought to change the world as you saw fit. The choices of your upbringing, the path you carved in your youth, the fruits of your struggle, the consequences of your sacrifice. All of it led you here, to the end of your time. And every choice had a price. Now, years and years later, the crossroads of your life echo in your memory, the pain and joy in... Trisibly intermingled. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you for the sub, Sir Blather. Could you have taken a different path, chosen a different calling, found a different place in the world? You had the power to alter the very course of history. Now, on the verge of death, you struggle with doubt, seeking answers to the last and most crucial question of all. Your life, all the paths in life, why did you walk this one? Did you choose your own fate, or was your life shaped by forces beyond your control? What determines a man's destiny? What question are we trying to answer here, chat? Oh, this is what we're answering. See, excuse me, I haven't actually played this game yet. Your destiny was forged by a power greater than your own will. How very meta. <laughs> the man himself? Hell yeah, chat. Your life has always been yours to live. You made your own destiny. You can hear death's footsteps drawing near. You square your shoulders and take a deep, full breath. You have found your final answer. What is destiny other than a long chain of your own actions and decisions? No matter what happened in your life, you always had a choice. You lived the life you deserved. Only you can answer for it. But are you right about this? Is it all true? To learn the truth, you have to return to the very beginning, remembering every step you took along the way. On those pages, the story of a man named Oman. <laughs> a man named Chad Bronte will live once more. Ignore chat when making decisions? Oh, I was gonna ask for chat input. I thought it would be fun. We'll see, we'll see. Thoughts on the controversy of tomboy MILFs just being soccer moms? Honestly, if you don't think soccer moms are hot, there's something wrong with you. Chapter 1, Childhood. Where life begins, first words, first unsteady steps, you are but a small child learning about the world in which you were born. To you, everything is so new, so baffling, so unforgiving. A long, trying life stretches before you, so many feats and faults, so many fateful choices to come. Yet you are already sowing the seeds of your future self. You are learning to live and survive in this world, looking for a place within it to call your own, choosing your own future destiny. Who will you grow up to be? I guess we're gonna find out, chat. Is that an aroge? I actually have, uh, two aroges. Wait, oh, that's- oh my god, I thought you meant a hoge. <sighs> Alright, thanks guys for coming to my stream. <laughs> Prologue. 
In chapters childhood, adolescence, and youth, you will live through your hero's coming of age. You will shape the protagonist's personality, his qualities, and relationships. By the end of the prologue, you will determine the estate and future occupation of your hero. Only in adulthood will he start to influence the world around him and even the ultimate fate of the Empire. Who will Chad Bronte grow up to be? It's your call. Pan from Twitch. <laughs> Childhood where life begins. Oh fuck, we already read that. Personal life. Oh, I need to move my entire overlay. Give me one moment, chat. <sighs> you dare to study fencing like your father, even though you have no right to it by birth. Hmm. Small child, you will suffer you for the death. Oh, so the death mechanic in this game. You can die, and it'll give you a boost to your stats, but you can only die three times. You experience an insight where your mother tells you about the ways of the world. You challenge a sacred order and attempt to see the noble lot. I imagine this is stuff we can come back to once we've already beaten the game. Your personal qualities at this age, they determine which choices you may take. Your perseverance and strength of character, your ability to get your way, it affects your frame of mind and the skills you have when you grow up. It represents how attentive you are to other people in the world around you, your ability to comprehend and learn. It affects your frame of mind and the skills you have when you grow up. Hot diggity shit. I already know willpower is a resource. I think we're just gonna... Personality experience not available. We going. We go. We go, chat. Let me drink some water. At first, there was nothing. No time, no sensation. Nothing but darkness and void. But then, a will breathed life into nothingness. Matter and spirit were set in motion. History began its march. It was your turn to enter this world. We're gonna make him a right old Chad. A right old Chad, chap, chat. A right old Chad, chap, chat. Fuck. Your first memory. You are lying on your back, blinded by a bright white light. Chad, chap, chat. <laughs> you are not alone. Above you tower the colossal figures of those who created you. You are part of them, and they are part of you. Both you and them is an inexplicable connection, a strong, unbreakable link. They will always watch over you, guard you, and protect you. Chat, is that... is that me? Is that... is that me that he's looking at? Uh, again, thank you guys uh, for the subs. I'm trying to, you know... I I'll do my best to keep up with them, but not if it's in, like in the middle of a sentence. Thank you guys. It hurts to breathe. You let out the pain in the form of a desperate scream. Your creators extend their hands towards you. There are two of them, the ones who made your form from their own selves and brought you into this world. They are united, yet as they lean closer, oh, there are parents. You begin to see how different they are. You can already feel their differences and within you, within you, struggling against each other. Kind of nervous about the new thing. Nah, not yet. I mean, okay, I was, I was, but I'm good. The first figure is soft and empathetic, wise and merciful. The love that emanates from it wraps you head to toe like an invisible blanket. The warmth from it is never ending. Man, a lot of people's first time streams. This is a pretty weird one to come in for the first time. But welcome, welcome, take a seat. Make yourself some hot cocoa. This is a new thing. <laughs> The second figure is strong and powerful, commanding and noble. It is a harsh but fair, a beacon of guidance, a force of protection. Thank you for the gifted sub, gravy and biscuits. And merciless punishment for every misdeed. Yet, there is also a third figure. It is like a shadow, barely seen behind them, yet already pulsing with an unbreakable will to live. It is the very will to live that is now growing ever stronger within you. A soft open palm, a strong closed fist, a lingering distant shadow. 
You struggle to loosen the swaddling clothes wrapped around you and extend a tiny hand into the world. Oh my god, I need to- okay, overlay is fine. I like the shadow, but I feel like we can get willpower through other means. Like, willpower is more of a, a resource. Uh, determination and perception are both stats. The fist. See, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of determination. I am sitting up straight, Halfrost. Perception. I think I want to do determination. I want to reach out to my father. Fist bump the dad. We need a Chad. We need him to be a beautiful, beautiful Chad. The fist is stiff, coarse, even unpleasant to the touch, but this firm hand belongs to your father. A tiny newborn, you are helpless before the full-grown man. Your little hand practically challenges him and his strength, and he accepts the challenge. Hell yeah, that's a good fist pump, little man. Your father's fist opens, his hand strokes your little hand gently, if somewhat awkwardly. It is a tender gesture, a glimpse into something he will seldom let show in the years to come. Hot diggity shit. Hydration shack. Mm. Thank you, chat. Your life in this world begins. How will you live it? Oh, we're just a little one-year-old baby. We're a fluffy little baby, chat. As the days go by, you learn to tell your parents apart. You recognize father by his heavy breath and strong, cold hands. He, ris he visits you rarely. Thank you for the sub, Aduffin. Hello there, little Chad Bronte. Mother's tender voice, however, follows you day and night. Uh, thank you for the gifted sub, Sa. Thank you, thank you. My, you're growing so quickly, my child. There are two more children in the family named Stefan and Gloria. Gloria sings songs to you. She often dresses you in tight clothing. What? Why? And gently holds your hands as you learn to take your first steps. Stefan likes to sweep you up and pinch you and toss you into the air. Oh look, this is your brother and sister. Yeah, you're my little brother. We're gonna play together, but I'll always be in charge because you were born a commoner. Be quiet, you. He doesn't understand yet. Come on, baby Chad, let's go play in the yard. Oh no, am I gonna have to come up with character voices? Oh no. <laughs> Thank you for the sub, Visk the Doodad. It is hot outside. You grip your brother's hand with one hand and your sister's with another as they help you walk down the giant stone stairs. Then you sit on the ground and start exploring those sparse blades of grass with your fingers. It tickles. In the sky far above you and away from you is a gigantic pillar, a perfectly straight stick made of light. How eloquent. It is so bright, it hurts to look at. Stefan? Does Stefan- should- oh no, am I gonna give Stefan a gimmicky voice? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Why are you staring at the stone pillar? Wait, no. I mean, no, he's like a little asshole kid. Nah, man, I'm not gonna do it. He's like a little shit, so I was gonna be like, I'm Papyrus. <laughs> I'm Stefan. No, we're not doing that. Uh, Stefan says, why are you staring at the shining pillar? It's not going anywhere, you know? That was good? Nah. Nah. <laughs> Hey, I want to play hide and seek. Gloria says he's just a little baby. How is he going to play? Then you hide him, and I'll try to find both of you. Backing up like a coward? Aw, oh, fuck. I guess I'm going to do it. You have no idea what they're talking about, but you support them with happy cooing. 
This is strange, but so exciting. Stefan and Gloria glance at each other. Then your brother walks to a big tree, closes his eyes, and starts shouting something. Gloria takes your hand and walks you through the yard. Your sister takes you behind some thick bushes by a tall wall. Thank you for the sub, Hive Nozo. The light from that light stick on the horizon barely reaches here. You can't see home from this place. The ground is crawling with tiny bugs. Gloria sits you down on the ground and puts a finger to her mouth for some reason. And then she's gone. You can no longer hear Stefan's voice. Gloria is nowhere to be seen. You feel colder. The bugs are no fun to play with. You've been sitting here for a long time, completely alone. Nobody checks on you. Did they forget about you? Did they abandon you? We could go for, I guess, a determination build here. Or we could start to rack up some willpower. I think willpower will benefit us in the future. Sit there and wait like a chad. Sit and wait. I'll take a little bit of perception. It'll come in use one of these days. Thank you for the resub, well man. The bush is covered with leaves swaying in the wind. You brush through them with your fingers. The twigs and branches are stiff and will not bend. They are different from the blades of grass. Down on the ground, you see a group of bugs carrying a, t a little twig. You grab it from them. They're so funny. One of the bugs crawls onto your finger and bites it, just enough to sting a little. You hear brisk steps, then the leaves and twigs rustling and parting. Your mother leans over you. You greet her with a happy face and show her the finger with the bug on it. <laughs> so that's where they took you. Mother picks you up, puts you to her chest, and pats you on the head. Your brother and sister stand behind her, clearly feeling guilty. Gloria is in tears. Stefan keeps staring at his feet. Thank you for the resub, Super Weep Trash. You hug Mother tightly. She is here now. Why is there a bug on my finger? I'm the bug on your finger. The Great Scent. Another memory. You are still a little child, but you can already talk and run on your own. Today is out of the ordinary. Father is busy around the house, giving orders to the servants. Throughout the day, the kitchen has been abuzz with work, and there are solemn, gloomy preparations and candles being lit. Oh my god, I need to burp. Hold on. <laughs> Even your older brother, Stefan, is quiet today. Mother takes your hand and brings you to your sister, Gloria. My son, today is the great descent. We honor the day when the twin gods descended to us. We must spend this day in reverence to the gods. You are too young to understand, so just do everything your sister says for now. Gloria takes you to the playroom. There are no toys there, no chairs. Even the carpet has been taken away. There's nothing there but a bare wooden floor. Today we're not allowed to go to any other rooms. And we'll be eating nothing but gruel and stale bread. On the day of the Great Descent, everyone must be where they belong. Thank you for the sub, Sinister Mike. It is quiet. Unusually so. Muffled voices from beyond the door are all you can hear. You are sitting on the cold floor, confused, with no idea what to do. Then you hear your sister's voice, a lonely sound in the empty room. It is a little song that mother taught you, taught her. You hold your breath as you listen to it. When the twins came down to earth, they brought lots for every birth. Let us count them, one, two, three. The twins made them for you and me. Nobles rule and bravely fight. They protect us with their might. Priests work hard to understand. Guide us by the twins' command. Common people work and toil. Always patient, never spoiled. Where's the singing? I don't know what the... I don't know what the tune of this is, chat. Thank you for the sub, Grace. Oh no, uh... Grace, thank you for the sub. <clears throat> 
Live your lot where you were born to the day when you pass on. Know your lot and know the prayer for the twin sea everywhere. For the... Got it. <laughs> you are transfixed by the tune. Gloria notices your gaze and a smile creeps across her face. You like the rhyme, don't you, Chad? Don't you, Chad Thundercock? Don't you know what it's all about? Look, there are three lots. They were brought to us by the twins when they descended from the shining pillar. Remember that pillar of right light on the horizon? That's it. You can see the shining pillar anytime from anywhere in the world. And again, have a, have a good night, anybody who is going to sleep, uh, and anybody who falls asleep during this stream. If you follow your lot as you live, you'll reach the peak of the pillar. And if you don't, you'll get eternal torment at the foot. You and I are lowborn. Mom is a commoner too. So the lot for you and me is to suffer and be patient and work hard. Understand? The priests and the nobles have other lots. The nobles fight and rule over everybody. The priests, well, I'm not really sure what they do, but I guess they talk to the twins and te then teach everybody. Gloria stares at you intently. Did you get it, silly? Then she shakes her head and keeps singing the song over and over again. Her voice transfixes you, drawing you in. The room starts to glow like the sky. From this light emerge two figures you have known ever since the moment of your birth. One of them embraces your sister's shoulder. The other stands guard behind her back. You watch this happening before your very eyes, unable to turn away. Gloria is swaying to the song, unaware of what is happening. She sings the final verses once more. Know your lot and know the prayer. You feel compelled by this divine sight to express yourself somehow. You feel words condensing within you from the light. But what will those words be? <laughs> I mean, we have to sing it wrong, reject God, but I almost wanted to become a priest. Mm. We're gonna be so, so determined. Chad Thundercock fucks it up again. <laughs> know your lot and know the prayer. The lots are lies told everywhere. You shout these words, but you have no idea how they came to you. The shining pair standing behind her back turn to look at you. You can feel their gaze piercing you from top to bottom. When the moment passes, they melt into the dim light coming from the window. Now Gloria is staring at you. You see disappointment in her eyes. Chad, that's not the way the song ends. Why'd you ruin it? Silly Billy. <laughs> you shrug, quite pleased with your cleverness. No priest chats. I guess we're not becoming priest. You are starting to understand more and more of what the adults say. Your family is an unusual one. Your father is a nobleman, but not by birth. His is a title earned through great service. But your mother is a low-born woman, a commoner. Because of this, you were born a commoner, but father says you may yet come unto nobility. Priests don't get to fuck, Chad needs to fuck. Gotcha. Thank you for the resub, Forever Zero. You learn to read at an early age. Together with Mother, you read and learn by heart the many poems about the divine twins, the twin gods who reside upon the shining pillar. Mother calls these poems prayers. Again and again, you try to discern the shapes of the gods in the strip of holy light that shines in the sky all day and all night, but the light is too blinding to gaze upon. The greatest joy of all when the stairs are no longer an insurmountable obstacle. Now you can jump and even jump from step to step. Father urges you to be more careful and avoid climbing too high. But even though you keep falling, 
You will never stop being curious about the world around you. Your older brother Stefan, that asshole, now spends less and less time playing with Gloria and you. Playing with commoners is beneath a nobleman to be, he says. So Gloria calls him names, and Stefan pulls her pigtails. One fine evening, Father gas gathers you all into the sitting room with an announcement. You will have another little brother or sister soon. Gloria asks him to bring home a little sister. Another brother would be too much. Stefan gets frustrated. There are too many little siblings getting in his way as it is. Soon you will be an older brother too, and it doesn't really matter who the youngest will be. A boy or a girl, you will love them the most. Chad's gonna kick his ass. When Father comes back from his trip, he reads his adult books aloud for you. You find these stories of wars, generals, and rebellions quite enchanting. And Father approves of your fascination. Study hard. Maybe one day you'll become a noble of the mantle and earn your sword. But first, you need to grow up. Growing up, the concept is as terrifying as it is alluring. Thank you for the resub, Anasazi. <laughs> a lot of suffering. A lot of suffering. You keep staring at the carpet under your feet. You are both ashamed and proud, and it feels odd. A scratch on your hand stings a little. Stefan is standing next to you, sniffling from pain. Oh, we kicked his ass, chat. We, f we crushed it. Your little brother was training in the yard with a wooden sword. You wanted to play with him, but he ended up getting angry and throwing the sword at you. The stick hit you in the shoulder. You picked it up and hit him with it. Thank you for the 1500 bits, Chlamydia. I appreciate it. You see mother's shoes walking to and fro on the carpet. You do not want to look up. You would rather not see her angry. She is not as gentle to you these days. Why did you hurt Stefan, Chad? You stammer out an explanation. He hit you first. You just hit him back. Thank you for the sub, No Woods Owl. How dare he pester me like that? When I grow up, I'm gonna hit you with a Wait, no, this is the guy with the voice. Hold on. <laughs> How dare he pester me like that? When I grow up, I'm gonna hit you with a real sword. <laughs> Mother shushes you both and speaks to you again. Her voice is stern, yet you feel her concern for you. Even if a Stefan hits you, you cannot hit him back. You are my son, and I was born a commoner. Our lot is to suffer. But your brother was born from a noble father and a noble mother. His sacrament is coming soon, and then he'll rule over the likes of us. Thank you for the resub, Sky. If you hurt a noble, you must be punished. That is your lot. And the sooner you learn it, the better off your entire family will be. Our entire family. <laughs> noble D's nuts. Now Stefan looks at you in triumph. You look up at Mother in fear, not sure what to do now. We can improve our relationship with Stefan. Personally, chat, um, I'm saying fuck Stefan. I mean, you know, not like, don't, not actually do that. But it's unlocked. It's locked to us anyways, because we don't have willpower yet. Now we can demand an explanation, deny our guilt. I mean, we're, we're, we could pump our determination a little bit more. Although, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking we need a little bit more perception. Mm. We'll pump our determination soon. You start asking questions. Why were you born a commoner if your father is a noble? If you have your father's name, why can't you have his lot? And why can't you choose a lot for yourself if you don't like the one you have? 
Mother is stunned by all the questions you are peppering her with. Don't you dare ask me about that, chadly thundercock. I'll violate my lot if I start explaining it all to you. I'm a commoner, not a priest. Thank you for the subs, Bankwise. You are flogged in front of your entire family. The pain burns on your skin again and again. The tears keep rolling down your cheeks. It feels like the punishment will never end. It hurts to walk when you are finally let go. You slowly climb the stairs and walk to your room. You see a book on your bed. The Teachings of Isadias, Volume 2. Your tears have dried now. You begin to read, slowly making your way through the difficult text. Every death of the body bringeth the soul ever closer to the twin's judgment. And when the body dieth a true death, the soul soareth to the shining pillar. The twin gods do judge every soul, and their judgment is stern and unforgiving. He who followeth his lot in life from birth shall melt in bliss atop the peak of the shining pillar. The words confuse and elude you, instilling fear and awe. Yeah, I know what that's like. I also grew up in a church. You will read this mysterious book again and again as you grow up. Thank you for the sub, Sleepless Mortem. Mother mostly stays in her chambers now. With each passing day, she grows heavier and her features get rounder. It gets difficult for her to walk, but she still smiles all the time. One day, she takes your hands and puts them on her big belly, and you feel a movement deep inside her. You will have another brother or sister soon. Thank you for the sub, Unspeakable Jelly. Gloria takes you on walks to the yard now. You explore the yard together under the evening light of the pillar, and she sings you songs and tells you amazing stories. Hey Chad, don't you want to hear a rhyme? I wrote it myself. There's even a little bit about you, but don't tell anyone, okay? Writing poems and songs is only for nobles. If mommy hears about it, I'll get flogged. Remember how you got flogged for hitting Stefan? Our judge is my second father. In the past, I had another. Mother says the twins are great, says we should not fight our fate. Brother loves to jump around. Please don't fall down on the ground. See, I wrote a little rhyme. Please don't tell them it is mine. But today, your sister is nowhere to be seen. She promised to take you to the old pond and show you the red frogs that live there, but then she vanished. Thank you for the sub, skull meat and unspeakable jelly. The servants join you in your search. Even mother leaves her chambers when she hears the commotion. Finally, you find Gloria in the far corner of the garden. She is holding a quill and sheets of paper covered in poetry. Mother becomes angry the moment she sees it. She looks through the poetry and her face grows dark with rage. Gloria is standing before her, wringing her hands, looking for an opportunity to run, but there seems to be no escape. What is this nonsense, Gloria? We talked about this. You were told to take care of your little brother. You are absolutely not allowed to entertain yourself with this writing. I could decide that for myself, Mom. No, you cannot. It has already been decided by the gods. And he's not a little brother anymore. He doesn't need a nanny. And I need some time alone to think for myself. I am not hurting anyone. You are a commoner and a future wife. It is time it- Reagan, what? Hold on. Hold- <laughs> Reagan, Reaganomics, thank you for the dono. Thank you for streaming, Junie. I don't want to seem overbearing, but you really do brighten up my days when you stream. I'm glad I found you. I'm glad you found a niche here, and I'm thankful to be part of it. So yeah, keep doing as you're doing. Reagan, thank you, thank you so, so, so much. You are, uh, you are a good mod. I, I appreciate you every single day. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I'm gonna have to sit down after that one. But I'm already sitting, chat. So what do we do now, huh? 
Uh, again, really, really appreciated, Reagan. Uh, had your discreet f fuck. <laughs> I need to get back on that. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to get back on the on the the, the page here. Thank you, Reagan. Had your disgraceful former father kept me in his house, you could have been born a noble, but that is not our fate, and you are absolutely forbidden from ever spoiling paper and wasting ink again. Mother grabs Gloria firmly by the hand and takes you both into the house. The scribbled sheets fly into the fireplace. Gloria sobs violently. You are a bystander to the scene, unsure of how to act. Oh... We need willpower for these, don't we? Oh, but did you complain about your sister? No, we need we need to pump our willpower. We haven't done any of it yet. We just need a little bit. It'll benefit us in the future. They look like unlocked options. Oh, I'm a dumbass. But we did need some willpower. You slip out of the sitting room and go back to the playroom before the scene reaches a conclusion. We'll have many opportunities to defend Gloria in the future, I believe. You can still hear Mother yelling and Gloria crying behind your back as you leave. Back in the playroom, you start building a formidable fortress out of wooden blocks to busy yourself. If only you had toy soldiers to storm it. A little while, the playroom door opens. You're not mad at me, are you? You shake your head. Can I stay with you for a while? You nod and return to your game. Gloria sits on the floor in a faraway corner of the room. I do feel really bad for leaving Gloria high and dry. <laughs> we'll make it up for her. We'll make it up for her, chat. <clears throat> She'll live. <laughs> Mother is in her armchair knitting wool jackets, pants, and socks for the little one. The baby will need to be kept warm after all. Father spends less time at home now. Mother says he's very busy with his important job. He is a judge after all. One day, you decide to ask Mother about Stefan and Gloria. How come they're brother and sister to you, but not siblings to each other? Well, my dear, I didn't give birth to Stefan, you see. He's the son of another mother, and Gloria is the daughter of another father. Come now, don't knit your brow like that. You'll understand when you're older. How is that even possible? You're all family, are you not? Several days later, Mother calls Stefan and Gloria to the sitting room. You sneak in after them. At first, Mother gets angry and asks you to leave, but then she relents. You are told to sit still, be quiet, and remember every word you hear. When you enter the temple, bow to the twins, first to the elder on the right, then to the younger on the left. Stefan, you're a nobleman to be. So walk along the side, paved with marble, where the benches are. Gloria, you will walk along the sharp side. When you're there, you must get down on your knees, each on your own side. Stefan, kiss the sword. Gloria, my daughter, they will strike you with the lash. Don't be afraid of it. Resign yourself to the suffering it brings. It is the blessing of your lot. Gloria doesn't like the idea of the lash. There's a tense feeling in your chest as well. You were told to remember this. Will the lash strike you too one day? On the next day, they take your brother and sister to the temple. You run towards them when they finally come back. The back of Gloria's dress is soaked with blood. She's hunched a bit, sobbing quietly. Stefan is putting on airs, acting prouder than ever. Nothing looks different about them. It's like all is the same, and yet everything has changed. Each of them has accepted their lot. 
I guess we should start building some relations soon. Not with Stefan, though. Fuck that little shit. I'm gonna beat him in a duel one day. If my route takes me in that direction. Route? Route. You eye the little bundle in your father's arms with curiosity. Behind the many layers of swaddling clothes is your newborn baby brother. Mother is glowing and smiling with joy. Stefan and Gloria are also here, all excited. You promise yourself you're going to be the best big brother in the world. You'll never hit them. Oh no. The two of you will play together, and tease Stefan together, and help Mother together, and go on so many adventures together. It feels so strange to be an older brother. Just the other day you were the youngest in the family, but everything is different now. Your parents name your little brother Nathan, and Mother spends day and night by his side. And Nathan cries all the time, day and night. Mother barely gets any sleep. She is so worn out. She starts forgetting things. Like today, for instance. She forgot her knitting in the armchair in the sitting room. You'd better bring it back to her as soon as possible. Yo, that's your name? We got a, we got a little baby Nathan in chat? <laughs> Don't worry, I bet you'll come out of it totally fine. You run to mother's bedroom. You miss her smile so much. You walk in without saying hello and give her the knitting. Thank you for the three gifted subs, Bunny Gif. Thank you, thank you. I know Bunny Bunny GF is in here also. Uh, I don't know if she's still here, but I, I did see you. Uh, and I hope you're having a good evening. You walk in without saying hello and give her the knitting, but instead of gratitude, you get an ice-cold, exhausted stare. Nathan is also in there, screaming all the time. Go away, Chad, you're bothering me. She spits these words out through her teeth. Oh, sorry, let me reread it. Go away, Chad, you're bothering me. <laughs> you look at the bawling newborn. She can't even get a minute of respite. Enough already. When are you going to stop? I just want some peace and quiet. Mother leaps across the room and starts shaking Nathan with malice in her eyes. Her cries get his cries get even louder. She looks so tired from his never-ending screams. She seems to be within an inch of smashing him against the wall. Somebody has to do something. You are scared of your mother right now. But you fear for Nathan's life much more. See, chat, this is why we took a little bit of willpower. Or we could take... We could take a hit of determination. We could build a relationship with our little son. Save the babu. I think we need to save the babu. You leap at your mother and demand she give you Nathan. She freezes when she hears the words. You snatch your little brother out of her arms. She chokes with rage and falls onto the bed screaming. You run away to the playroom. Now we can punt the baby. <laughs> with mother out of the picture. Your baby brother is heavy in your arms. He sniffles. You sway him gently like Mother did, and quietly sing him a lullaby about the twins. Nathan calms down, soon he closes his eyes. You put the newborn on your bed and swear on your life that no one will ever hurt him when you're around. You hear heavy footsteps in the hallway. Father enters the room. He looks at you, then at Nathan, somewhat confused. You did something bigger than you today, son. It is a noble deed to protect your family, but you should have come to me. Please understand, this was my duty, not yours. You saved your baby brother from harm. If you feel ready to take the responsibility to protect others, then maybe you can walk the path of the noble when you're older. But for now, we should bring him back to your mother. Come with me. 
He picks Nathan up. Your brother is fast asleep, breathing quietly. Is he actually asleep or unconscious? <laughs> the three of you return to Mother's bedroom. A father puts Nathan back in the crib. Mother is no longer screaming. She embraces you. Please forgive me. The twins know I was out of my mind. Please don't be angry with me. You hug Mother in response. Sweet. But we're down a little bit of willpower. Should be no biggie. You wake up to father's touch on your shoulder. He is finally back home after a long trip. Chad, today- hold on. Chad, today is your special day. The day when you begin your studies. Now, teachers will be coming to your home to teach you our home. And you must do everything they say. Be diligent in your studies, and you will grow closer to the nobleman's lot. And since you must remember this day, a present is in order. Lydia, get out our little- get our little schoolboy dressed. I am taking him to the market district. Stefan wants to come with you too, but his but father shushes him sternly. This is your day. Your elder brother is hurt to hear this, but stays quiet. Yeah, he fucking does. <laughs> Hold on, I need to pop my neck. Sorry. <laughs> Mike probably picked that up. An open carriage takes the two of you through the dusty, noisy city streets. A pleasant wind tussling your hair. Thank you for the 1500 bits, Hall Frost. Your city is called Anazote. We'll call it, we'll call it on Anazote, yeah, sure. That you already know. It is one of the largest cities in the entire empire. There is a big shadow on the street. It comes from the white foliage of an enormous tree that spreads its branches all above the city. My son, did you know that the silver tree grew from the blood of our god's own disciples? It what, sir? <laughs> it has been growing here for hundreds of years, right in our city. It cannot be damaged or burned, not even the clergy knows why. The carriage comes to a halt by a small shop next to the city square. You run in there and freeze by the stalls in excitement. The shop is packed with dolls and figurines and toys. You've never seen so many at once before. Have you chosen your present yet? Father asks. You have. You want the Holy Order set, which includes several figurines of the Empire's greatest warriors of all time. You rattle off everything you know about the Holy Order. They were the ones who aided the Empire, Emperor's own forces in seizing, seizing the province of Magra and storming our city. That's how we joined the Empire. Father nods in approval. Very well. War isn't your lot for now, but maybe these toy soldiers will teach you to think like a general. We will lead them into battle and study military strategy. Go ahead. Take your present. Having said this, Father turns away to examine the books. You run to the box of toy soldiers, delirious with excitement. But there is a fancy dressed boy on your way. He is about to take your warriors for himself. He elbows you aside and reaches for the box. Anger overcomes you, and you push him from behind. Your opponent falls to the floor. <laughs> The rich boy screams so loudly, everybody in the shop hears it. He hit me. He hit me. A tall tower of a man looms over you. This is the boy's father. But then you feel your own father's hands on your shoulders. What happened? You press against father. Your mind's more at ease now. He will protect you. Yes, you shove the boy to the floor in front of everyone, but he tried to take your present for himself. Father turns you around to face him when he hears those words. Is this true, Chad? 
Did you strike the son of a nobleman? Oh, shit. I think I might want to admit your guilt. Honorable way. <laughs> Honor, chat. Honor. Truth? Or admit your- wait, what's the difference between these other than the stat? Hmm. <laughs> I think we're gonna- I think we're gonna burn up the last of our willpower. We're gonna have to get some of it back. Hmm. It's just- I feel like a relationship with our father is valuable. I'm gonna do it. You recall mother's words. If you hurt a noble, you must be punished. There is no use trying to lie to escape it. You say that it was all your fault. You pushed the other boy to the floor because you wanted to get your present before him. Father nods to you, relieved to hear it and the enraged nobleman grabs you by the hand and drags you out onto the street. The law is the law, and your punishment is due. They lead you and the nobleman's son out of the shop. You are told to bow to him and show humility. A bad feeling sends a shiver down your spine. With a satisfied grin on his face, the boy swings his arm and slaps you on the cheek. He strikes you again and again. Father stays quiet all the while, but as you ride home after the punishment is over, he shows you a rectangular package. I am proud to see you living by your lot. Ah, oh, fuck. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> a shame. A common birth leads to a life of humility, and you are told the truth and accepted your punishment like a man. This present is yours, my son. Inside is a little box with the ten soldiers of the Holy Orders inside. They are your reward for humility. Our relations are looking good. Just need maybe a little bit more. Oh. Cool. Yo, fuck that kid though. Trying to take my toys. He had it coming. But he got dust all over his fancy clothes. Today, father ordered the dinner table to be brought out into the yard. For the first time in months, he's home, outside of the confines of his always locked study. He spent the entire day playing along with Nathan and you, discussing various matters with Stefan, now an adolescent, and walking in the garden. And now a dinner under the open sky. Your entire family gathers around, with father at the head of the table, smiling. He asks each of you about your studies. Nathan climbs up onto his knee and recites a counting rhyme in a funny, sing-song voice. Yeah, I bet it was funny. Oh wait, no, sorry, I was thinking of Stefan. <laughs> Stefan mentions that his fencing teacher praised his accomplishments. He rises from the table together with father to show his skill in a practice duel. Next comes Gloria's turn. She stands on her chair and recites a lengthy prayer by heart. Mother showers your sister with praise. Father chuckles quietly, hiding a smile with his mustache. When your turn comes, you recite all the ranks in the Legion, from common soldier to high commander. Stefan listens to you with a skeptical look on his face. Night slowly falls, but the servants ensure that the yard is well illuminated. You don't feel cold in the dusk tonight. It feels good, yet so important. All of you are finally together, sitting at the same table. No fighting, just smiles. No arguing, just pleasant small talk. Then a servant approaches father with a letter in his hand. He reads it in the dim light, and each line gradually washes the smile off father's face until only a stone-cold mask remains. Mother looks at father, 
with an unspoken question in her eyes. Gregor Bronte is coming back to Anizote. He is the head of our family, my father. We see in Grandpappy. Your grandfather, Gregor Bronte, returned to the family home from the capital. Ever since the news of grandfather's- oh, hold on. Let me stretch, chat. Let me stretch. <sighs> Ever since the news of grandfather's impending arrival, there has not been a single day when the house has not been cleaned or decorated. Your parents anxiously make sure everything is in order. They tell you to wash your face and hands after walks and scold you for leaving books on the floor. They tell Gloria she will be flogged if she is ever seen hiding in the attic. They make Stefan stay in his room. Even baby Nathan gets in trouble. Yo, how does a baby get into trouble? <laughs> Then, one day, Grandfather arrives. It is a grim day. So hot, your neck is sticky with sweat. Father, Mother, Stefan, Gloria, you and Nathan, the entire Bronte Thundercock family stands on the porch in front of the house. The house servants lined up behind you. The carriage arrives and out steps a tall, gaunt old man with a heavy walking stick and a heavier gaze. You cringe instinctively <laughs> good health to you father oh i need a need a need a voice for this man good health to good good health to you father no wait shit that's my dad sorry good health to you father children greet your grandfather as you have been taught I can't fucking do it. <laughs> Still trying to look like a real nobleman, are you? Wait, he's an old man. <clears throat> Still trying to look like a real nobleman, are ya? <laughs> are ya, boy? <laughs> the woo voice or the grandpa? No. I have to take it a little seriously. You can't fool me, Robert. <laughs> I was the first of the Bronte family nah, to be ennobled by the mantle, and I am the only one who remembers how to bear this burden properly. I live honorably by my lot. Your marriage to that low-born wench cut us off from ever becoming nobles of the sword. My progeny could have been born bearing noble blood. Father, I beg you, this is not the place. You guys actually want me to oo-woo this man's voice? <laughs> Grandfather eyes him with scorn and walks into the house, so we won't have to decide just yet. Kill your grandfather, start a revolution? See, that's why we're stacking that determination. The entire family following close behind him. I have been away for far too long. The entire house is a mess. This is an insult. How can you live in such a pigsty, Robert? The servants have gone far too lazy, all thanks to your commoner of a wife. I warned you, did I not? And yet you did as you saw fit. And the children? What do they know of tradition or honor? <laughs> I'm, I'm like a dog chasing a car. I don't know what I would do if I caught one. They are being raised in a virtuous family, father. And now you're speaking like a lowborn who's content to live in humility. Twins willing. Now that I am here, this will not happen again. I am taking your oldest son to the capital. I see you cannot provide Stefan with a proper education, so I will correct your mistake. Your brother's fate has been decided just like that. Father does not object. Thank you for the reset, a slightly broken pogo stick and squarmf. He orders the servants to prepare Stefan for the journey. 
Stefan freezes in place, glancing at grandfather and father again and again. The latter puts a hand on his shoulder reassuringly. Grandfather's lips are a tight line, white with contempt. The house is examined, room after room. Yo, Stefan is gone, chat! <laughs> Yo, Stefan is gone! Everything Grandfather sees is showered with scorn. He scoffs at a crease on a blanket in Nathan's crib in Mother's bedroom. He mocks Gloria's knitting in her room. The door to your room is next. Thank you for the sub, Captain Jelly, and thank you for the bids, life's trope. What is this, Robert? Ten soldiers in your younger boy's room, younger son's room. He was born a commoner. I won't have him daydreaming about battle. Thank you for the resub, Mike the Squid, and thank you for the resub, Zachers. <laughs> Grandfather seizes the box containing the ten warriors of the Holy Order. Oh no, I haven't unlocked either of these? Your father stays silent. Anger and fear boil within you. This is your big present from the first day of your studies. It means so much to you. But what if he's right? What if you need to prove your right to command the toy soldiers first? Grandfather shakes his head in disapproval and shoves the toy box into the roaring fireplace. If you wait too long, they will melt in the flames. Yo... If we hit him, we take a death, which means our stats go up, but we can only die three times. Are we going to smack him up? Strike him down. <laughs> our first kill in the revolution chat. Probably, I mean, we're probably not going to kill him, but like, we can dream. Overwhelmed by helpless rage, you run to Grandfather and kick him in the leg with all of the strength you can muster. Yet, he is immovable. The next thing you see is him leaning, towering over you menacingly, his heavy walking stick in hand. Low-born scum, how dare you raise a hand to me. The blow hits home. The handle of the walking stick is as heavy as a rock. You are dazed, robbed of both hearing and sight. Down comes another blow. A sharp pain splits your head. Then, darkness. Your hand twitches against your will. Then again and again, like it's trying to catch a flying butterfly. And then you fall into the primordial void. The void takes away a part of you, one of the lives you were given to live. It will never return. There is pain and desperation and a sense of loss. Nothing can be done now. First death. You fall into a pain that embraces you like a soft feather bed. You feel light, free, there are no restraints, just a warm glow that envelops you in its secure embrace. The waves carry you. Their touch is soft, they delicately enshroud what was once your body. It is a feeling unlike anything you've ever experienced before, something absolute and complete. You touch something greater, the reason behind everything, the reason for your very existence. You were sculpted from this light. It was the first thing you ever felt. A boundless and sincere unity. <laughs> unity. <laughs> unity of the diverse. Your beginning was a spark that cast this light in all directions. And now you are here again. One with the beginning of everything. The light gleaming from you resembles the light of the shining pillar. You still see it in the north, as always. The waves of light carry you to two fingers. The elder... Oh my god. Did I really just... The waves of light carry you to two figures. 
The eldest is nearest. He is ready to accept you. He is wise, quiet, kind, and pure. The younger waits further back. You do not know what he is yet. The waves pause at the elder's feet. He leans over you and plants a feather-like kiss on your forehead. The kiss spreads all over you. You are filled with unparalleled delight and bliss. You exist. You are unique. There is no one else like you. They know this and they love you. You will never be alone. You are a part of them, a part of your family, a part of this universe. The twin gods will never leave you. They watch over you constantly. The elder softly touches you as you lie spread out amongst the waves, sending you further down the torrent of light. You float on to the top of the silver tree's spreading crown. The closer you get to the silver tree, the heavier you become. The waves draw you down its trunk, but you do not wish to part with the warmth and the softness, with the love. You turn around. The elder is still watching you. He nods, all is as it should be. Go. Your time has not yet come. You must return to the world now. As you tumble down towards your body, you comprehend the true meaning of your lesser death and the divine love that has been revealed to you. Love exists not only in the hereafter. It is present in the entire design of the twins that is the origin of all life on this earth. What is the manifestation of this love in your mortal life? Empire, lot, family, cause, yourself, silence. Family, you think? Yourself. To influence your deeds, whatever your mission is, it is a proof that the twins got love for you. I don't like cause. Thank you for the sub, Mr. April. Cause. Well, I'll think about cause. Cause is Chad, you think? I think self is Chad. <laughs> I think Ch Chad Thundercock chooses himself for this playthrough. A sudden comprehension of the love with which the entire world is imbued with illuminates your mind, but then it fades away and vanishes. You regain the sensation of your flesh. It is heavy and unwieldy. It lacks that lightness, that weight. It is a burden. It's smothering you. You gasp for air. Your chest expands painfully. You feel as though your lungs are about to burst. The stagnant odor of the crypt fills them, revolting but so real. You are back. Welcome back. Thank you for the gifted subs, Fox Eye Valkyrie. Then you smell a sickly, moist smell. You feel dampness all around you. You come back to your senses in the gloom of the family crypt, lying flat on a stone slab. Thank you for the resub, Servani. Your parents are on their way to the crypt right now. You hear their mouthful voices. They are arguing, and against all rules, mother will not agree with father. Why would Sir Gregor do this? He just took one of our child's lives. Lydia, my father is our family's head, and the boy raised a hand to him. There was nothing we could do, and father did admit that he was too hard on him. Please do not anger Sir Gregor. You need to accept this. It will never happen to any of our children ever again. Their voices grow quiet as they lean over you. You lean on your elbows and try to get up from the stone. Mother gingerly wraps her cloak around your naked body as you shiver from the cold. Oh, okay, so this is just normal. My son, your first death came far too soon. I know it might be difficult to realize what happened, but know this. The twin gods are ever merciful. You are a child, and your time to leave for the hereafter has not yet come. You will be returned here by the gods twice more, but do not tempt fate again. It's never, ever defy those who can easily take your life. Chad, you have greatly angered your grandfather. Do not stand in Sir Gregor's way ever again, and he will never hurt you again. For now, just stay away from him. 
Father steps away from you, not saying a word. When Mother finishes talking, he picks you up and carries you outside. Together, your family takes you from the family crypt. On your way out of the crypt, you take a moment to touch your head. It is perfectly fine. There is no sign of the blow. Back home, Grandfather is still walking through the house, examining the rooms. You see that Stefan and Gloria are disturbed by what had just happened. Nathan starts crying when he sees you. The playroom still reeks of burnt paint. There is something new about you now. A pitch black stripe on your left arm. It looks like a strange bit of dirt at first, but it will not wash off. It will be like that forever, Mother explains. That is all she will say of it. Oh no, Grandpappy is distasteful of us? Man, that's gonna suck when we guillotine him. Suffer your first death. As a small child, you will suffer your first death and rebirth. You do, you do, not you will. Fuck that guy. <laughs> Soon, Grandfather leaves. Your elder brother, Stefan, goes with him. From that day on, Grandfather's hired teachers tend to you alone. Hold on. Water. Does that mean you have to kill him three times to actually kill him? <laughs> we'll kill him as many times as it takes. They bore you with monotonous lectures on writing, counting, and the way of life in the blessed Arknean Empire. You often distract yourself from their instructions by playing with your younger brother, Nathan. Your home grows quiet without your elder brother. Too quiet. Weeks later, your family receives a letter from Stefan. Grandfather has sent him to a boarding school for nobles, and he is now studying hard in preparation for his service as a nobleman. Thank you for the resub, uh, LP mine. <laughs> the rules here are way too strict. <laughs> you can't even sneeze without the teacher's permission, but I have been studying with my peers. We are learning how to live as nobles in a noble society. We are also learning the art of sword play. That's my favorite part. Oh, I can't wait to guillotine you too. With Stefan now at the boarding school, Grandfather arrives once more. This time to live in your home. The only good thing is that he often has urgent business in Eterna, the capital of the Empire, and has to travel there. One day, you ask Mother where he lived before. In Eterna, she says, but now his place is here. But each time Grandfather returns, he gives the servants new orders. Your home is now always busy with repairs. The servants are redecorating Grandfather's chambers, including his library and sitting room. Sometimes Father tries to gently talk him out of this. Why subject the house to constant reconstruction? Grandfather's answer is always the same. This home is mine, and I will live here, as benefits a man of the nobility. Man, what a dick. Some days, Grandfather stays at home, and on those days, you try your best to stay out of his sight. But there is no way you can avoid family breakfast. The food is there, but you cannot bring yourself to eat it. Mother's eyes are red and swollen. She has been crying all night. Again. Grandfather sits at the head of the table, where nobody used to sit before. Uh, we're actually pretty close to the end of chapter one, and I think I'm gonna call it at that. It'll be nice. It'll be good. Uh, a, a nice introduction to this weird new thing I'm trying. <laughs> Robert, it is high time your youngest sons underwent their sacraments. Sir Bronte, please, let them live free of the lot for a while longer. They are but... Shut your mouth. Robert, that wife of yours, is impertinent enough to interrupt me. If this ever happens again, she'll be eating her gruel with the servants in the kitchen where she belongs. It is time you considered a real marriage, Robert. One to a woman of proper station. Gloria drops her fork. Grandfather shoots her a scathing look. A tear rolls down Mother's cheek. 
Father does not look away from his plate. His hands clenched into fists. Baroness L. Lodar is one such woman. She is a comely widow and a fine match. She is suing for her inheritance right now and could use proper support in a husband. You can keep your lowborn Lydia around if you like, servant, mistress, I don't care. I will not do that, father. Thank you for the resub, Killer Kane. For the three months, thank you. I am the head of this family, and the family standing took a severe blow after you married that commoner. It is unthinkable. How could you give that up for the memory of beautiful... How could you give up the memory of beautiful Amalia Elborn for this lowly woman and that bastard child of hers? But now you have a chance to set things right. Don't disappoint me. This game is on Steam. Uh, thank you for the sub, Uncle Spartan. Father nods curtly, trying not to look in Mother's direction. Father, I wish to see Stefan. If I find your conduct in the Baroness's presence satisfactory enough, then you may see him. She is coming for a visit tomorrow. Be prepared. Grandfather wipes his mouth with his napkin, throws it onto his plate, and leaves. Mother's lips move silently. Nobody says a word. When Father stands up and orders you and the other children back to your rooms, he needs to speak to Mother in private. Father comes to your room just before bedtime. He sits on the edge of the bed and adjusts a crease on the woolen blanket. He distanced himself from you after Stefan's departure, so you are not used to such attention from him. In the candlelight, you can see his face in the dark. There is a sour expression on it. My son, Baroness. Oh my god, I thought he was calling Baroness his son. Emma L. Lodar will be visiting us tomorrow. Please be quiet and treat her with respect. Nathan will do as you do. I want this dinner to be as immaculate as possible. Don't let me down. The next day, Mother starts dressing you and Nathan for the coming dinner. You see bread all around her eyes. She has been crying, and for a long time, it hurts just to look at her. Nathan starts whining quietly. You and Nathan are dressed in new doublets, your tussled hair brushed into shape. Gloria is told to stay in her room. Father appears wearing his best suit. Mother is in a humble brown dress, looking pale. Grandfather has an uncharacteristically contented look about him. Oh, fuck this guy. You hear the sound of wheels and hooves against the cobbles in the yard, then a pair of dainty heels come clacking. The antechamber is completely quiet and still, fearing Grandfather's observant eye. The door opens. You see your guest, a beautiful, dark-haired woman in a dress of an elegant, deep blue. Have a good night, Jagger Moon. And good night to anybody else who is uh, passing out. <laughs> Thank you for the gifted sub, Fowlin. Father takes the hand of Lady El Lodar and kisses it, showering her in compliments. Grandfather's face is beaming in her presence. Nobody even bothers to introduce Mother. Baroness, allow me to introduce you to Robert's sons, Chad and Nathan Bronte. Frankly, it's his eldest, Stefan, who deserves the most attention, but currently he is studying in Eterna with other young noblemen like himself. It is my hope that his younger sons will also make me proud one day. Grandfather eyes you with a probing look. How will you act in front of the Baroness? Will you accept her? Right here next to your mother? Your father's rightful wife? Oh, I'm sending this man to the Shadow Realm. Oh yeah. Wait. One of these must be true. Okay. Perception has to be higher than four. Wait, how can I unlock it then? Oh, loss of reputation. I don't know if I want to take that. Maintain composure. Play nice. Banish him. Hmm. Oh, one of these must be true. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're sending him to the Shadow Realm chat. 
You father follow father's example and kiss the baroness's fingers gently. Her laughter fills the antechamber, ringing like chimes. Behind your back, you can hear mother sobbing. Grandfather nods to you in approval. Thank you for the resub, Curl Blackfeather, for the six months. Out of the corner of your eye, you see Mother quietly walking upstairs. No, this is wrong. This cannot be. You walk up to Father, look him in the eye, and ask in a voice loud enough to be heard by everyone. Why didn't he introduce Mother to the guest? She is his legal wife and your mother, is she not? Thank you for the bits, Chlamydia. Have a good work, and have a good night. There is silence. Mother stops on the stairs and turns her head in surprise. Father is confused. Nathan starts whining again. Grandfather grinds his teeth, his hand tightly gripping the heavy walking stick. You keep father transfixed by your gaze. After a few moments that feel like an eternity, he winks at you. Almost imperceptibly. Then adjusts his doublet and turns to your noble guest. Yo! <laughs> Baroness, allow me to introduce Lydia Bronte, my wife and mother, to my younger children. Lydia, would you be so kind as to join us for dinner? What are you saying, Robert? Father, it would be a disgrace to hold a family dinner without the lady of the house. Father marches up the stairs and offers his hand to Mother. She accepts it and walks down with a shy smile on her face. For the first time in those many days, the Baroness presses her lips in contempt at the sight. After a long moment, Grandfather finally breaks the uneasy silence and leads everyone to the dining room. Mother sits at the furthest corner of the table, claiming that she needs to watch over Nathan. There's barely any small talk over dinner, apart from the Baroness and Grandfather discussing her widowhood and inheritance litigation. Father and Mother do not say a word throughout the meal, yet they no longer look as tense as the day before. There's not even a mention of any potential marriage. As soon as the door closes behind the Baroness, you flee to your bedroom and lock the door. Grandfather's heavy steps can already be heard from the hallway. He is a force of anger, eager to get his hands on you. Welp, you had the nerve to interfere in the adult's affairs. I know it's whelp, like... <laughs> I know it's whelp, like, like, you know, like a puppy, but like... <laughs> but like... <laughs> whelp? Whelp, son? <laughs> oh, excuse me. You ruined the dinner with the Baroness. Open the door this instant and face the punishment you deserve. Then suddenly, his voice dies down. You hear Father speaking quietly. We both realize there can no longer be no other marriage, Father. I already have a wife, and there's nothing to be done about it. I'm sorry, Father, but you will have to accept it. And please, leave my son alone. He only helped me face the truth and nothing else. Grandfather huffs and puffs, at a loss for words. You hear the head of the Bronte family and his adult son retreat from the door of your room. It seems there will be no punishment today after all. Have a good night, Doom Trooper. Don't ever talk to me or my son ever again. <laughs> Grandfather leaves for Eterna, alone. About a fortnight later, Grandfather receives a letter from Stefan. It seems Grandfather told him about the incident with the Baroness, so the letter is full of ire. He writes that you have reminded high society about Father's marriage to a lowborn woman, and now the family's reputation is at stake. Father winces when he reads Stefan's letter, deep in thought. But Mother is smiling again because of Father's accent. actions, her joy, the quiet, happy glow. Yo, this man hates my ass. That's fine. We got unity. We got... Reputation's a little rough. You can't win them all. Have a good night, Pika Wizard. 
We are on our last chapter of our childhood chat. And then I'm going to be calling it for the night. The Kaleidoscope. Father now checks on your studies often and nitpicks you for sitting or eating or speaking in an incorrect fashion. Once he becomes so annoyed, he says that he wishes Stefan had been the one to stay home instead of you. Man! You never expected to hear those words from your father of all people. Grandfather's trip to the capital took longer than expected. It feels lighter around the house without his presence. You allow yourself a little change of scenery. Instead of your room, you are now busy yourself. You now busy yourself with reading and calculations in the sitting room across from the open door to the yard. Gloria has joined you today. She's already helped you progress through several complex progress through several complex passages in the book. Passages. <laughs> Right now, she seems preoccupied with a strange tube. I need to drink water, you guys can probably tell. Aren't you hurt by the way Grandfather treats you, you ask? Gloria just shrugs. Grandfather always says that they should get rid of me. I'm used to it now. He hurts you a lot worse because you're closer to him. I just have to stay out of his way. That's it. I had a cursive moment. <laughs> she shows you the strange tube she has been holding all day. Look, it's a kaleidoscope. I got it as a gift. Want to see inside? Excited by the idea, you close the book and peer into the tiny hole on one end of the tube. Your eyes see a multitude of intricate patterns. Each turn of the tube reveals a new web of interwoven colors. They mesmerize you. The kaleidoscope turns the fire burning in the fireplace into a cavalry made of flames. You are riding at the front of the fiery horsemen, ready to face the enemy. Grandfather's face emerges from the intersecting lines, and you swing the kaleidoscope like a sword, cutting it in half. Now you look at the blue sky through the window. The patterns are unending, secretive, calm, and peaceful. Just like Father's smile before Grandfather's invasion. The deep blue gives way to a scattering of gold radiating gentle warmth, like Mother's arms. This fleeting beauty too soon gives away to a hypnotic new pattern. Again and again you see your family and these interconnecting figures as they come together and break apart. And in the middle of this golden glow you see Gloria's green eyes gazing at you intently. Observantly, same thing. Your sister left you long ago. The books are abandoned. And time slips away unchecked. But you are still busy peering into the kaleidoscope. Order emerges from the chaos before your eyes again and again, but you cannot preserve it no matter how hard you try. Yo. She... You are caught in an inner conflict. There's so much that can be done with this kaleidoscope. Should you take it apart or ask Gloria how it works or keep enjoying the patterns it shows you? But you still have lessons to do today. Hmm. I don't think we have... I think we need to take... Hmm. Study. Yeah, we need to pump that determination, I think. We got zero willpower. Yeah, we're gonna have to make up for that at some point. I got a little stat greedy, maybe. You put the kaleidoscope away and return to studying the book. There's so much you have to discuss with Gloria, you cannot help but wonder. What things did she see in there? But first, your lessons. Zero willpower is not fun. Gotcha. It is my first playthrough. When Father walks in, he sees you hard at work over the book. He chuckles in approval, then spots the kaleidoscope on the table next to you. He puts the toy to his eye, then freezes still for a moment. It takes him an effort to put it back down. Then he praises you for being diligent and leaves. And when today's section of the book is finished, you take the toy upstairs to your sister's room and tell her what you saw in it. Gloria smiles, knowing what you felt. I once saw a ballroom full of dancers. I watched it for an entire hour. My hands even got sore. Have a good night, Kazzy. 
You spend a long time with your sister, disgusting, dis <laughs> discussing the kaleidoscopic figures. You feel a strong connection to her. The toy has brought you closer together, made you interconnected, just like the lines and the figures and its colorful eye. Is it time for a sacrament? This event is a consequence of your previous actions. Hmm. <laughs> you spend a long time with your sister. Disgusting. When father is not working long hours, you often see him spending long stretches of time in the backyard practicing his fencing. You are allowed to watch, but that is it. You are forbidden from touching the sword, let alone actually learning how to fight with it. It is a new day today, and father has been busy in his study since early morning. Mother took Gloria and Nathan to the shops. Your studies are done for today. The house is empty. You spot father's sword hanging by the yard door. You must have left it there by accident after a training session. You deliberate at first, then grab the sword with resolve and run outside. At last, you have a chance to see it up close. It is a small sword, used for dueling, heavy, and devoid of any ornamentation. You recall that it was made specifically for him. The weapon is difficult to handle. Its heft makes the palm of your hand shake. As you get used to it, you try your best to imitate father's feints. Your technique leaves much to be desired, but at least it's something. You imagine yourself fighting for the family's honor as the thin blade slices through the air. But you swing too far back, the blade nicks your shoulder and cuts through your shirt, staining the fabric crimson. The sword falls to the ground with a dull clang. You try to apply pressure to the wound to make it stop bleeding, but all you do is make the blood flow faster. Chad, what are you doing here? The familiar voice hurts you more than the cut of the sword. Father walks up to you briskly. His rugged arms rip off a length of cloth and bandage your shoulder. He squats by your side and pulls you into an awkward embrace. My son, why did you have to take the sword? You know you're not supposed to hold it. This is no toy. It is a weapon that could... Excuse me. <laughs> it is a weapon that can take lives. I know how you feel. I used to yearn for my father's dueling sword back when I was a lad. One day, you might have a chance to earn the right to carry a weapon, but first, you must have patience and study and become a noble. When that day comes, I will be proud to teach you myself. <laughs> you rarely spend time with father without someone else around. There is paternal love in his voice, so much that even the cut on your shoulder barely hurts now. You would be glad to be convinced by what he said, but how can you forget your dream? How can you abandon it just to earn your father's approval? Is it right for him to ask you? To ask so much of you? Hmm. Oh, we can't even do that. We don't have... Oh. Oh, hell yeah. Fuck, we're at negative willpower, aren't we? Let's pump that determination. Agree? Hmm. We need that willpower, you think? And their relationship with our dad. Yeah, let's let's agree with him. Better option. You take a deep breath and then slowly and solemnly swear that you will never touch a sword again until you earn a nobleman's title. This promise is a difficult one for you to make. No more secret fights with an imaginary blade. No more battle with sticks. If you give up if you give your word, you must keep it. Wait, does that include the guillotine? Father smiles at you warmly. It is one thing to make a promise and another to keep it. But I know you can do it, my son. You are on your way to becoming a man of your word. Let's go back inside now. He picks up the sword and leads you back into the house. You wash the blood from the cut and agree to keep this a secret from everybody. Then when father asks you to come into a study with him. Oops. He tells you stories of his studies in the capital. He tells you about studying for the judgeship and the trials he had to face to be ennobled by the mantle. Father brings several toy soldiers from the house. He uses them to reenact the famous Battle of the Green River. 
The floor of the study becomes a battlefield, and the books from his table turn into riverside hills. You try your best to remember his every word. Oh, look at that. Just a little bit more. Thank you for the gifted sub, Super Grump, to Haruka. Yo, Haruka, welcome, welcome. It's story time. Grandfather's visits are no longer a cause for fear and panic in the house. He has become something you are used to, something nagging yet not unordinary, like a splinter or stain in your trousers. The tension still remains, however. Sir Gregor's disdain for everyone in the house is so palpable, it almost stings for real. Your lessons with a tutor are done for today. You are walking down the stairs when you spot Gloria peeping into the sitting room through an, a slightly open door. You sneak up on your sister and tap her lightly on the shoulder. She is startled. Oh, it's you, Chad. Look, Sir Gregor's eating something. Grandfather is sitting on the sofa, flipping through a book with one hand and reaching for a glass bowl with another now and then. Inside the bowl, you see candied fruits. A sweet confectionery forbidden to the common estate, like all sweet things. Thank you for the bits, Grey Probe. Woke up at 11 p.m. to catch up with the stream. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yet, Grandfather's face shows no pleasure as he keeps consuming the highborn treats. The clock strikes three. Grandfather rises from his seat, puts away the bowl on a shelf, and leaves for the yard. He always takes a walk in the city at this time. Gloria nudges you with her elbow and looks at the candy bowl while you look at her. The first emotion you feel is fear, but next comes curiosity and it is stronger. Stefan used to boast that candied fruit tastes incredible, and now you have a perfect opportunity to try it. You try a candied fruit first. The sugar starts to melt as soon as you put it on your tongue. It's so sweet. You've never eaten anything as good as this. Somebody asked me if I could be a D&D &D patron in chat. Uh, yeah, sure. Go crazy. Go ham. You take the whole bowl off the shelf and give it to her, your sister. She takes a fruit and brings it to her mouth, carefully, like a rare treasure. There is a thumping on the stairs, footsteps accompanied by the knocking of a walking stick. You have no idea why, but Grandfather is back. You quickly hide behind the sofa and pull Gloria after you, but she is frozen in place with the bowl in her hands. The door opens. Grandfather's menacing figure advances on Gloria. His hand seizes her arm. You squalid, ungrateful, low-born child. How dare you bite the hand that feeds you? You and your trollop of a mother would be sleeping in a ditch if it weren't for my spineless son. The sweet and pleasant things in life are for the noble estate, not for likes of you. Did you forget your lot? Thank you for the bit, Sunset Guru. His hand swings and hits Glory on the cheek. She falls to the floor, right next to where you are hidden. Her fingers glisten with the warm melted sugar that brought her here, brought you here. Grandfather advances again, his walking stick ready. But then he sees you, huddling behind the armchair. Please don't hurt him, Sir Bronte. This is all my fault. He tried to stop me. You can already see a bruise on Gloria's cheek. This is only the beginning of her punishment. Gloria is caught red-handed, unlike you. You can still avoid your punishment. What is it then, Milksop? Did you try the sugar too? Or were you trying to stop this piece of filth like she says? Hmm... Oh, are we going to lose that willpower again? It really doesn't sit right with me. Oh, or we could get more willpower. We're going to lose our relationship with Gloria. We cannot mock him. We don't have enough. Um, weird. I can't mock him. Lie? Yeah, I think we need to lie. I think we need the willpower. You hate to see it. I, I hate to throw Gloria under the bus again, but... Go with truth so we can mock him later. 
I just, oh, we're gonna lose the willpower if we tell the truth. I hate it. Oh, I hate it. I think truth, truth. Mm. It doesn't, it doesn't sit right with me. Uh, but the perception, I think it's just this time, we'll try to get Gloria back later in life. I know I said that last time. <laughs> you stand up. Oh man, she did give us a chance. <sighs> it's difficult choices, difficult choices. You actually ate a candied fruit, but Gloria only touched it. You hope this will help your sister avoid punishment. You are quickly proven wrong. Grandfather's face is red with rage. He strikes you both with his walking stick, blow for blow. He keeps hitting you until he grows tired, and then he leaves you where you are. Soon enough, Mother comes in to find the two of you on the floor, too afraid to move. She shakes her head in disappointment. You are badly hurt and covered in bruises, yet she still forces you to kneel and recite the... The what? The precepts on the lot and how important it is to follow them. Then you stand before father and grandfather and swear to never take things that do not belong to you again. <sighs> rough. Rough, bud. Yeah, we should have taken the willpower, honestly. I didn't realize I was in the negatives. Not good. Not good, chat. Your younger brother Nathan is growing. Mother spends more time with the rest of the family now. You help her and play with your brother and take care of him when she asks. You often go to mother's room and sit at the foot of her bed after Nathan falls asleep. She reads you the sacred books and asks you about the things you learned that day. During these moments, you see the world through her eyes as well. One day, the door of your room opens and she brings in a large box covered with a piece of cloth. It's rare for you to see her so overjoyed. She sets the box on the floor and removes the cloth. The box under the cloth is made of glass and has a wooden base. Inside you see a layer of earth shaped into these carefully carved, crafted passages. And these passages are full of hardworking ants. Chad, this is my gift to you. An ant farm. It's a little world in a small box. We can watch them through the glass. Look, this is the queen ant. She is the reason all these little ants were born. You sit by the box together. You hold her breath. Your breath. <laughs> you hold her breath as you watch the ant colony at work. There turns out to be a method to the ants' chaotic movements. Every single one of them has a task to perform. Some of them have larger mandibles. They are the protectors of the colony. They can draw blood from your finger. Others work all around the colony, repairing the walls and clearing any debris from the passages. There are also workers who collect food that you put in a special tray. Leaves, bits of meat, maggots, and bring it to the rest of the colony. Do you guys like Ants Canada? I watch Ants Canada. Thank you for the resub, ya boy Hova. You take a worker ant and put it right next to the food. However, the insect has no interest in it. It starts circling around the tray aimlessly. Mother takes the stray ant and puts it back where it belongs. Why did you do that, my son? The ants cannot do what they weren't born to do. Each of them was born for their own job. God, I love Ants Canada. He's so, so enthusiastic. You shake your head slowly. If only the ants could do whatever you wanted them to do. This is your gift now, so they belong to you. Or maybe Mother's presence is the reason they won't obey you. Hmm. I think we really need to take that willpower. Mother's look is full of warmth and love. Nathan, Gloria, and Father are away right now. For the first time in a long while, it is just the two of you. And Mother takes great joy in watching off the ant farm. She shares her knowledge of the world with you. The things she tells you are true. 
You move closer and suggest going outside and finding some bugs for the ants. She agrees to this happily and holds your hand as you leave the house. Soon you are busy catching bugs and she please no moths. <laughs> and sharing your thoughts on how the ants will feed the colony with them. From time to time, you laugh together, making up stories about errant flies and caterpillars overthrowing the ant kingdom. One of the greatest mysteries of Ants Canada was what happened to that one mantis that disappeared in that one ant colony that was supposed to control their population. Oh, you know they ate it. That boy got munched. You and Mother hold hands as you return to your room. She can't help but smile. It's a faint smile, a child smile, a smile full of sunlight. You are so happy to have seen the world through her eyes today. That's good. I'm glad our relations with both of our parents are okay. Oh, it's sacrament day, baby. It's sacrament day. And then I'm going to end stream once we get through this because it'll be the end of the chapter. Father and mother have been focused on Nathan and you since early morning. Instead of breakfast, you are told to say your prayers, wash your face and hands, get dressed in plain white t-shirts. Today is the day of your sacrament. Mother, I want to go play in the yard. No playing today. You and Chad are big boys now. It is time for you both to have your first sacrament. No one can live without a lot. I don't want a lot. Be quiet and listen. You were born commoners, so you must accept a lowborn lot before the twins. When you grow up, you will get a chance to earn a noble lot. Father and mother take you to the carriage. Nathan is hungry. He starts whining. Grandfather is the last to get in the carriage. His eyes are on you and your brother, looking for every fault. Soon, the carriage is moving along the streets of Anisote, slowly and solemnly. One more turn, and you see the colossal white building marked by two massive pillars. For the first time in your life, you are to enter the Church of the Twin Gods. You enter the gate and walk under the splendorous dome of the church. The church hall is divided into two halves. They are drastically different from one another. The floor on one side is rough and jagged and covered in dried brown spots, while the floor on the right is made of smooth marble. The commoners kneel on the jagged floor, and the well-dressed nobles and their families sit on pews. Father and grandfather leave you to sit on one of the nobles' pews. Mother walks to the rough stone of the commoner's side and gets down on her knees. You see her wince in pain. For the lowborn estate shall suffer in the house of faith. The church acolytes surround you and lead you to the altar, where you and other children will make your sacrament this day. Will take your sacrament. Before you stands a tall priest dressed in black with a sword in one hand and a hefty whip in the other. Nathan's whining gr grows louder. He dislikes this place. He is scared. You remain quiet, but your stomach roils in uneasy anticipation. The first child to take the sacrament is a jaunty little boy from a family of nobles. The priest extends the sword before him and recites the words of his lot. From this day forth, he will fight and rule and pursue the arts. His mind now free forever from the throes of suffering, for he now belongs to the noble lot. The boy proudly touches the flat of the blade with his lips. Got a drink, hold on. Nathan is next to receive the sacrament. He suddenly snaps out of his fearful trance and tries to break free, but the acolyte pulls him towards the altar and throws him on the jagged floor on the lowborn side. The sharp edges bite into Nathan's knees as he lands, spraying drops of red around him. I don't want to- Chad, why do they want to whip me? What do I do? You try to break free and run to Nathan's side. You want to give him courage and protect him, but the acolyte's grip on you is too firm. You feel utterly helpless. Your little brother has to face the world all by himself. 
The priest starts reciting the words of the lot as he swings the lash over Nathan's shoulders. From this day forth, Nathan, thou shalt endure and work and suffer. Thou shalt be ardent in thy labor and humble in obedience to thy rulers. And now cometh thy first true suffering, which thou must accept with gratitude. The lash cracks. It strikes his right shoulder. It strikes his left shoulder. The blows are so powerful that Nathan falls to the floor. The priest tells him to rise. He has received his lot. Nathan gets on his feet and drags himself towards Mother, his knees torn and bloodied, his spirit broken. It is your turn. Your feet will not move. You can barely muster enough strength to walk to the altar. You get down on your knees and feel the sharp stones below. So sharp, your clothing cannot protect you. Your skin begins to burn. The acolyte forces your head down, and you feel the lash being drawn above you, ready to strike. The priest's words are for you now. This is thy sacrament. Thou shalt work and endure and suffer. Thou art about to receive thy first true suffering by the sacred lash. Dost thou accept thy lot? <sighs> oh, I want to kiss the sword. Catch the lash. <laughs> I think I should catch it. Kiss or catch? To kiss or catch? Hmm. <laughs> kiss. Oh, chat's pretty divided. Hmm. Now. If this makes our destiny a, a nobleman's sacrament, we can't overthrow the nobleman. Maybe we can do it from the inside. The whip slices through the air, about to strike, but your eyes are transfixed by the blade the priest holds in his other hand. You jump up and away. The lash misses you. You grab the blade with your hands. It cuts into them without mercy. The priest wrenches it away from your bloodied fingers. You look him straight in the eye. I am Chad Thundercock of House Bronte. <laughs> the priest freezes in shock. You see this moment, sees this moment to pull the blade closer and closer and kiss the cold, smooth sword. You hear cries of outrage among the churchgoers. Mother prostrates herself on the jagged floor, racked with fear. Father remains still, baffled by what you have just done. But Grandfather looks at you intently, as though truly seeing you for the first time. There is a semblance of respect in his gaze. You are forced back to the commoner's place at the altar. The acolytes seize you by the arms and legs and keep your face bent closely to the bloody, jagged stones of the floor. The lash strikes your right shoulder, then your left so shoulder. You are told to rise. You are a commoner. Mother takes your hand and leads you out of the church. Once you are outside, she scolds you for being insubordinate and bringing shame to your family. Nathan holds your hand as you walk, his tearful face a mixture of confusion and awe as he looks into your eyes. But you do not feel as though you have made a mistake. You do what was right for you. Oh, oh, I thought I had more. Ooh, ooh. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> That's gonna bite us in the ass later. You have taken your first sacrament and received the commoner's lot. That's rough. That's rough, chap. 
You challenge the sacred order and attempt to seize a noble lot. Hell yeah, that's not gonna be the last time. <laughs> the mark left on you by the sacrament takes a long, long time to heal. Mother says it is just a reminder of your lot. Suffering and sufferance, pain and patience. Gloria shows you the mark of the lash on her shoulder one day. It will never disappear. You are a commoner now. This is the lot you were born into. But father keeps telling you to study hard, so you may yet earn a different lot and become a noble of the mantle. You recall the past with warm sadness. When Stefan still lived with you, when he wrote to you for a time shortly after he left, now he thinks it beneath him to write to commoners in his family. Mother didn't lock herself in the bedroom as often back then. This changed shortly before Nathan was born. But most importantly, you miss the time before the terrifying figure of your grandfather was constantly looming over you. You learn the true power of the lot only after the head of the family's arrival. In grandfather's eyes, no commoner deserves to be treated with kindness. Is this just him? Or is it the way of the entire world? The very thought makes you queasy. You are older now, and what's more, you are an elder brother now. You've learned how to care about something else, how to teach and protect. Soon, you are a small boy no longer. As the days passed, play gradually gives way to laborious study. Now your choices will decide your place in the bizarre and ruthless world of adulthood. Your childhood years are over. Cheers. I mean, all right. Let me take a look at some of these. This is, this is rough. <laughs> We're gonna have to fix one of these. All right, chat. All right, chat. Thank you for uh, sitting with me for chapter one of this game. I'm, this was sort of an experimental stream um, I'm definitely gonna do more of them. I think it's, you know, fun, especially for a late night stream. I, I know, like, when I first started, like, a few people were like, yo, you have a really good voice for, like, SCP readings or something. And I was like, that's an interesting idea. I'm definitely gonna entertain it. Also, I realized this whole time <laughs> my head's been facing downwards and it's been fucking up my entire mouth tracking. Thank you for the bits, gravy and biscuits. So let's, uh, I'm gonna take a look at Twitch real quick, see if we could find somebody to raid. Actually, let's hide this really, really, really quick. Look how cute our sleepy boy is. I mean, I know that's... <laughs> I made that today too. Do you usually have a fixed schedule? I, I don't right now. Oh, Snuffy? I'll raid Snuffy, of course. I don't have a fixed schedule yet, but I think I'm gonna do a fixed schedule for these streams specifically. What, you think my leg's asleep? I'm an insect. You don't know how my yeah, I think I <laughs> how my vascular I like system works. More. Yeah, let's write Snuffy. Uh thank you guys for uh <laughs> thank you guys for coming along with me on this strange adventure. Uh for those of you who are still awake, we're gonna be raiding Snuffy. A very, very cute raccoon. Uh can we Oh, oh, you want a moi? You, okay, I'll give you a kiss on the forehead, chat. Okay. Mwah. <laughs> uh, if we can come up with a raid message. Mm. Thank you for the bits, Ren Castle. Thank you. Kiss Moth. Yeah, Kiss Moth is always a good one. Wait, no, let me... Let me oh no, the hype drain is hiding my raid. <laughs> Uh, okay, there we go. All right, you guys know the drill. Uh, oh, oh, okay. All right, peace out. I love you, it's raining right now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> what? Wait. Okay. Okay, I, 
think it... Wait, the raid did... Why did the raid not go through? What? What's going on? I'm sorry, chat. I've scuffed the ending. I've scuffed the ending. It's still counting down. Oh my god. Ten seconds left. I'm just gonna wait it out. Sorry, this is awkward now. But it's okay. It's just you and me and a timer that is counting down. 